So Holy Spirit, thank you for your incredible goodness and your grace and your glory that you pour out upon us again and again and again. And today, this morning, we ask for fresh bread, fresh encounter, fresh, Lord, insight into the Father and who you are, Holy Spirit, who Jesus is. Would you release the glory of God? Would you open the heavens? Would you play with us and mess us up a little bit? Would you draw us closer to your heart? Lord, we love you and we honor you and we welcome you. Come and have your way, Lord. Come and go deeper into every heart of every man and woman that's here today. Lord, we are believing you for radical, transformed hearts and lives. We're believing you, Lord, that we will carry deposits of the richness and the goodness of God that will carry home with us, that will bring life and bring transformation, not just to us, but to every place where we, where we lay the soles of our feet. So fill this place, fill every home, every person watching online, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So you're welcome to come and stand, we can fill the front with, with praise and release the glory of God. It's great, once again, too, to have John and Alice and the whole team worshiping and leading us as lead worshipers this morning. So over to you guys.
praise, pour out your worship, your adoration.
for he is worthy to be praised. And lift up his
Yeah. 
desire of our hearts. We
to gaze upon beauty and to marvel at the one whose name is marvelous. We love you, Jesus. We love you. But the more we gaze upon your beauty, the more we become like you. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I feel just the, the goodness of God and the promise that he gives us is that he's near to those of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. His presence has come to, to heal. He's come to wash away just even some of the grief, to bring it to a whole new level. I think some of you have just so desperately cried out. You cried out for breakthrough, cried out for solutions, cried out for his presence. And I believe this morning he's, he's come to bring an answer. He's come to draw you to himself. He's, he's come to cause you to marvel. You know, the ability to marvel is a gift. We want to marvel at your beauty, Jesus. We want to marvel. We want to gaze upon your loveliness, your holiness. This morning we declare your glorious worth. You know, I believe that even what the Apostle John saw in Revelation 4 and 5, it's like the Lord is peeling back the veil. He's allowing us to see some of those things. We get to see, we get to behold. Jesus himself declared in John 5, 20 that you know, the Father loves the Son and tells Him all things that He does. And then He says, greater works than these I will do so that you may marvel. You know, I, I, I just sense, you know, in this journey, we're on this journey into His heart, into the glory of who He is. And, and you know, as we, as we take the time to, to behold Him, to receive Him, to bask in the glory and the beauty of God, it's like we become changed. We become changed by that glory. Release another wave, Holy Spirit. Release another wave upon us. Yeah. Release another wave. Peel back, Lord, that veil. We want to look upon your beauty. We want to say to you again that we love you. Why don't we sing that again? Why don't we sing a great love to you? to the one that first loved us.
washing away all shame. All shame goes in Jesus' name. to belong. You know, we have a good word for you this morning. You belong. You belong in the family of God. You belong in the kingdom. Right? All your past is washed away. Behold, all things become new. Tomorrow's going to be better than today. But today's a great day. Why don't you bless one another and, you know, honor and honor the Lord, but bless one another and just give each other a, a hug and you know, speak life, release glory. You know, we, we honor you this morning, Lord, as well as every person. He gives us a double portion of honor. Shame is washed away. Abba. Oh, Abba, Father. What a great God. You know, I believe that when we press into His presence like that, it's like there's, there's like deliverance that happens. There's cleansing that happens. We, we get closer and closer and draw nearer and nearer, and it's just more of Him and less of the old man. So we become renewed by gazing upon His beauty and glory. It's so good. And so it's a great day to, to be alive. And, uh, you know, welcome again this morning. We're ready for another awesome day. And thank you, Eric, for last night again. Last two nights was awesome. And uh, does anybody, anybody feel like, you know, you got a testimony or something really burning that the Lord has really manifested something in you, even the last two days, something really great and glorious that he's done. Maybe he's touched your body. He's brought healing to you. You know, just, if so, just kind of wave your hands at me. There's something the Lord has done. And so, yeah, come on up. If there's something, oh. Yeah, you have something the Lord has done? If anybody's got it, anybody waving their hands? Okay. Yeah, come on up. Yep, come on up. Just tell us what the Lord has done, who you are, where you're from. And I know Mary here. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> well, the first night I was here, I was just so excited to be here. And I just kind of started worshiping wildly, and I hurt my back. <laughs> It's terrible getting old. <laughs> so I've been walking around with this pain in my back. And uh, last night, after the teaching, a few people over there, my good friends Brian and Felicity and a beautiful young man named Gregory, prayed for my back. And I felt something move, but it still hurt. And then when I was walking down the hotel hall last night, I suddenly realized that it was completely gone. So, Amen. yeah. That's great. Yeah. We want to pray for people. Anybody, you know, back issues are just an ongoing reality. Who, who needs a healing for back issues this morning? Why don't you stand where you are? We're going to declare life over you. And both Mary and I together are going to speak the word of the Lord for healing. You go first, Mary. Just declare life. Okay. Well, Lord, I just thank you so much 
for your abundance towards us, for your graciousness and your mercy. And Father, I just ask for your blessing and your healing to come upon each person who is asking for it right now. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I declare that backs are healed right now in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's right. We agree, Father. Life, life in the spines, life in the necks, the cervical vertebrae, the lower backs, the lumbars, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why don't you move it around a little bit? Why don't you just do something that would have been sore before? Let's test it out. Say, Father, we thank you for life this morning. How many of you are feeling something that the Lord is, you know, there's just the presence of God and the anointing this morning that's releasing you? Who's got some, got some movement or got some release of pain where you are? Just raise your hands and wave wildly if there's something that's been going on. And for the rest of you, just keep praying. Just keep declaring and praying over them around you. Yeah, tell us your name and what's the Lord done. Yeah, it is thick up here, isn't it? Uh, my name is Jessica, and I'm from Alliston. And uh, the first night that we came, uh, Eric Johnson spoke two words that just smacked me in the face. And uh, one of them was uh, somebody um, injured their left ankle in a sport accident. I rolled my ankle really badly uh, playing ball hockey and, and broke it. And, uh, and then right after that, um, he spoke a word about um, somebody who was in a car accident five years ago. And uh, on the way here, I was chatting with my friend Christy, saying, telling her about this stupid fear that I, wanted to, I needed to get rid of over car accidents and whatnot. We were just talking about it. So when he said that, I just, it just totally undid me. I, I, in the car accident, I hurt my neck, chronic headaches. So just, I felt tingly heat on my neck. It was just incredible. Mm. It was incredible. Just. So how, hey amen. So how are you now? I'm feeling, I'm feeling awesome. No headaches, no headaches. My neck feels good. My ankle feels good. It's just good. So I, I felt like I was delivered from fear, that fear of uh, getting back into some rougher sports with my kids and no fear of, of cars and driving. It's good. Hey amen. Woo. Let's give the Lord a hand. Hey amen. And you know, I... Uh, Something Mary said earlier, too, quoting Eric, but she says, you know, it's tough getting older. And it's something you said, Eric, the other night, really registered. He says, you know, we don't, we're going to believe like fine wine that we get better with age, right? How many are in for that? Yeah, so we just declare in the name of Jesus that even any age-related ailments, quote, unquote, be gone in the name of Jesus. And we declare that the church of Jesus gets better with age, like fine wine. Life, we believe for it, Father. We believe and we'll declare it. You know, we're ambassadors of reconciliation, right? And so I think it's not just our spirits that come alive in Jesus. It's our soul and our body. You know, I know we got a resurrection body coming, but let's call it in today. Let's release it. So stretch your hands out to these gals. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for healing and life over you, Jessica, over you, Mary. And we declare, Lord, a lot of romping with kids and grandkids down the road. And we speak life and health on backs, on necks and knees in the name of Jesus. And Father, we bless every person that drives. You know, say no fear of accidents. No fear, Lord. You know, everything that can possibly go wrong will go right. We just break Murphy's Law. We declare that when we get out on the road that there's favor, there's angels watching over us. Even if we go a little over the speed limit. And Lord, that your grace is sufficient this morning. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, that's good. Yeah. Well, he's going to keep doing things. You know, one thing we're realizing is the faithfulness of God is, is uh, ever constant and increasing. His mercies are new every morning. And so there's good stuff going to happen today. I want to, uh, at this time, really let you know about a few things quickly. Number one, we're going to have a book signing from 1230 to 1 o'clock with Eric Johnson in the Resource Center out in Atwell Books. And so if you've got one of his books, we'd like to have a book signing. You can meet with Eric back there. And uh, we're just thr thrilled this morning to have John Arnett ministering uh, to us once again. And, you know, I realized that over the years, uh, the first time I listened to you, John, was back in 1988. And, uh, you know, throughout the years, just been so discipled and mentored and sat under the fathering of this amazing uh, spiritual father. And I've been blessed to be part of that, John. But, you know, not, not only through listening to the messages, but through reading some of the books. Like, here's one, The Invitation, that is an awesome book all about transforming 
lives through intimacy and transforming lives. I believe that's going to a whole new level, by the way. We're not just going to see lives transformed. We're going to see transformed lives transforming communities around us. You know, I believe that we're going to start to see the kingdom of heaven advance in great and glorious ways, that the marketplace is going to, you know, going to take off because of the boldness, because of your life being transformed, that you're going to engage the place of destiny and engage the, you know, really release the kingdom of God in, in wonderful ways. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. And uh, Grace and Forgiveness has now sold over a quarter of a million copies. You're maybe beyond that even, John, maybe 300,000 or 400 by now. But it's a great book. And so these are a couple of John's books uh, that are going to be available out in Atwell Books. But, um, you know, John, I just so appreciate the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you carry and the understanding that's there. And so why don't we welcome our founding pastor and spiritual father and, you know, a great, great man of God. We love you, John. Wow. I just texted Bill Johnson and said, you, sh you should be, or you can be, very, very proud of your son, Eric. He was just amazing. And uh, so totally enjoyed his uh, teaching and ministry for the last couple of nights. It's been great, hasn't it? And so he texted back, of course, and said, I am very, very proud. And we concluded by saying, what an amazing day in which we live. And so for me, being here, just watching the, the, the worship team and the camera crew and all of the people on, on our staff and our team here, it just feels like I'm surrounded by dread champions in the kingdom of heaven, you know? And uh, there's so many more that are scattered all over the earth. And what a day to be alive. Will you tell that to somebody? This is just the best season ever because of what we're in and because of where we're about to be. It's just great, great, great. Wow, Peter and Heather, good to see you guys sitting there. Why don't you come up and say hi, Pete, real quick. Um, Heather, you can come too if you'd like. Um, sure, sure, come on. These guys have been with us for many, many years. Uh, we met right when we planted the Toronto Church. We were, I think it's Silverthorne High School still. And uh, we met Peter and Heather and we'd go out for pizza every Sunday and all that kind of stuff. But he planted a church in Barrie, left us and went to Barrie, just an hour north. And um, then the Holy Spirit fell. And Peter's been pretty much laughing ever since. <laughs> so um, he had more hair then, I think. <laughs> but anyway, what's so funny, Peter? <laughs> okay, John. <laughs> The question of the ages. <laughs> oh, I can remember, uh, you know, in that first weekend, Shakarabaka, in 94, and, and John was putting the microphone in my, my mouth to say, what's happening? <laughs> because I had spent three hours rolling on the floor, laughing uncontrollably. Oh, and uh, just before that, uh, oh, that, uh, that laughter, I had, uh, oh, a lot of discouragement I didn't realize I had. And, you know, it was just, I, w I was trying to be a good pastor. <laughs> Whoa! And... Uh, um, a lot in my own strength, you know, <laughs> just trying to be a good vineyard pastor. Whoa! And very discouraged because I wasn't, in my own mind, measuring up to what I thought I should be. And just as um, I think it was Steve was sharing yesterday, the, uh, oh, 
<laughs> the whole thing of, you know, comparing yourself to somebody else, um, that just gets you more and more discouraged because there's always people around. <laughs> it, it's the people thing, John, you know? People, you know. It's so, whoa! <laughs> um. When we... When we compare ourselves to somebody else, ah, we forget about what's inside us and the unique expression we are of the Father's love. Yay. And, and we, we really, we dishonor him ah, because he looks at us, each one of us, uniquely, individually, as a vessel of his honor and his love. And um, so, you know, trying to be a good pastor doesn't work. <laughs> it's quite hysterical, really. <laughs> you have to get wrecked <laughs> again and again and again and realize that, you know, it's only by grace. It's only by grace. And, and be, being able to receive grace requires humility. Mm. And just like Steve was saying yesterday, humility is being authentic, being real, not trying to be somebody you're not, but just being who you really are. Yay. And uh, it's in that place of reality, God just seems to love to <laughs> undo us again and again. So we're, uh, whoa, we're here to get undone again. Yay. So good, Peter. You've been a wonderful model to me to just go for it in abandonment. You know, I think, how many would like to be a good pastor? You know, and, and, and so I, I, it's, imp it's important to remember to drink the new wine, especially if you're trying to be a good vineyard pastor, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so the wine is very important. Oh, oh Peter. The, the thing that um, puzzled a lot of people over the years, in, in the early days, was the fact that, surprisingly, the Holy Spirit was powerful. And so when he started to come upon people, and they started to lose it, get a little fuzzy, a little wobbly, a little uh, crazy in a good way, Many people didn't understand that, myself included, at first. I'm wondering, what is going on? You would think when God comes upon you, you would sharpen you. And, uh, and of course it does in the long term, but at the moment, it's almost like, how can this be God? Because these people are just wilting and laughing. But, but when you think about it, the Holy Spirit is bringing his personality into yours and filling you with love and joy and peace and all good things. So what do you look like when you're filled with love? A little bit crazy, yeah? What do you look like when you're filled with joy? What do you look like when you're filled with peace? What do you look like when you're filled with all three of those things at the same time? And so we, we, we worked out that it was very, very good to be overpowered by the Holy Spirit. And uh, probably my only disappointment with 23 years of revival is that people never got really where he was going with it. They wanted power so that they could be effective in ministry 
without necessarily a profound heart change. And see, he, he wants to make you and I Christ-like. How many figure I got a ways to go before I can stand alongside of him with any kind of uh, reasonable comparison here? <laughs> but I really want to be like him, don't you? And so it's kind of like into the fire again and, and just skim off a whole bunch of that stuff and, and, and just let the Holy Spirit shine forth out of you with his love and his joy and his peace. And God bless Peter. He, he's been able to do that so well, as has Carol. And, and so I watch them uh, as one who's not so overpowered uh, but yet wanting more, wanting more all the time. How many have never been here before? This week is your first time here. Let's see. Oh, my goodness. There's, there's almost too many of you to pray for you right now. But, uh, but let's have a go, shall we? Why don't you, why don't you stand? Now, <laughs> we do have a message, and I'm going to get to it, but the greatest thing that could happen to you is for the promise of the Father to come so mightily upon you that it would take you about three hours to peel yourself off the floor. And so I'm going to invite you to just to, well, the ones on this side, come up and stand at the front and the center in that section. Go and stand under the flags right now and stand on the green lines that are, come up here, that are really our altar because the altar is not big enough, so we have altar all over the place. But I don't want us to get top heavy with teaching and never get to the impartation part that I, I really, really, really want you to get completely undone by the Holy Spirit. And I used to, I used to tell people, whatever you do, don't go home too soon. It will take you about three days to process the manifestations, and, and this week it's kind of been a bit manifestation light. <laughs> Come on, Trevor, let's pray for this. So, those of you who have been here before, stretch your hands out toward them, and let's just take a moment and say, Oh, Holy Spirit, we love you. fire on him. We totally love you. We love you. And we want the Father's promise with all of our heart and all of our soul. Yeah. Jonathan, if you could come back and just sing that last song one more time. We love you, oh Father. If I could have uh, seven or eight guys to help catch, that would be wonderful. Fire on you here. Let it come. Filled in Jesus' name. Filled in Jesus' wonderful name. Oh, Lord, let it come. Fill him. Fill him. Filled in Jesus' name. Lord, we want to take time for Jesus said, wait for the promise of the Father. And we want to wait for that promise right now. Oh, Holy Spirit, what a tremendous promise you are. What a great promise you are. In the name of Jesus, will you fill us? Fill this man up. Let it come. Fill us. 
Pressing in for a moment, everybody. Pressing in. Oh, joy fills her. Love fills. Peace fills. Oh, yeah. In the name of Jesus. Holy Let's 
standard singer. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. You glory, God, is what I heart's long to be overcome by your presence. Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Tell him with all your heart, Come you're welcome here. our prayer that Holy Spirit you are so welcome here and we welcome you again as we do every service you're the faithful one who has been pouring yourself out on your people for 2,000 years and, and the best is yet to come Just lean over to your friend and lay hands on them and say, may that glorious, fiery presence come upon you right now. In the name of Jesus. May you go from this place encouraged, strengthened, excited, on fire once again. I want to speak to you for a few minutes on a message that's about being an overcomer. I sometimes call it the convoluted journey of life or the random journey of life because sometimes because of taking a maybe a shorter term perspective on what's going on around us, we miss the point that God is preparing you for eternity. But will you tell the person near you that God's getting you ready for eternity? And uh, that's going to be a long time. And I don't think we speak about it often enough, but there are eternal rewards that uh, he wants to come your way. He doesn't want you to miss it through dropping out by discouragement and, and things like that. And you see, when you have a go at something and it doesn't go the way you'd hoped, discouragement can come in and then it, it, it knocks the wind out of you for carrying on, pressing through, and, 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 and getting the desired results that you wanted in the first place. Uh, I noticed that when we were in Kenya last week, as you heard me um, sharing, uh, uh, we have a, pro a project there and other African countries, in the Philippines too, that have to do with our harvest gardens and teaching people to have these very healthy nutritional uh, gardens going on, but, but there's quite a science behind it. In other words, you gotta mulch it, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, but there's no fertilizers to buy, there's none of that, but uh, it, it really pays off when they get it going. However, because of not enough rain and uh, not enough attention to detail or this or that, every now and again, one of them fails. And it's because of discouragement. People are saying, well, we tried it, we did everything you said, but it didn't work. And so, eh, right? 
And I realize that much of life is just like that. There is a garden in your heart that God wants to cultivate that you need to water it, you need to nurture it, you need to weed it, you need to care for it because it is producing in you uh, eternal fruit and harvest that will impact in a powerful way your destiny. Now, how many want God's best in your life? So we want to talk about <clears throat> the, the effect discouragement. So let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And of course, Romans 8 is a fantastic chapter. I love verse 1 there. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So would that be you this, this morning? Three or four of you? Say, that's me. I am in Christ Jesus, therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so we, one of the things we need to learn is to tune out the voice of the accuser and tune in the voice of the comforter. And realize that God is always good, it's the devil that's always bad. But then we get down to uh, verse 28 that says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, which is you, he also predestined to be conformed to the image or the likeness of his son that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So you have a powerful, powerful destiny. Now, you know, in life we need to answer basic questions like, who am I, why am I here, uh, how did I get here, where am I going, and when's it all going to happen? You know, basic questions like that. That's why new Christians love to get straight into the book of Revelation and find out what's, what's coming, you know. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> it's not an easy book necessarily, but it does give you the idea. There's tremendous blessing coming and there's tremendous disaster coming. And what you want to do is get on the blessing side. And so <clears throat> we, we kind of get our way around that and we set out to, do, to live the Christian life. Like Peter said, he's trying to be uh, a, a, a really good pastor. And then the next question comes up, why is there so much adversity? Now see, adversity can make you or break you. Adversity can be a friend or the worst thing that ever happened to you. If it takes you out, it's not good. How many know? And see, I, I even look around for like 23 years of revival and there are people who were with us in the beginning, but they're not around anymore. They, they just got taken out somehow by life. Have you got any friends like that? And what happened? Well, if you, if you ask them, they'll tell you, well, I just never expected that this person would die or I would lose my way or with this or that or the other. And, and see, the, the, the tests of life come and, and, and our job is to pass those tests. Now, we have a friend named Jack Taylor. Many of you know Jack. Uh, he was at one time the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. So he's a spirit-filled, on-fire Baptist. And, and, but he, he said this to us one time. He said, do you know, you never fail with God. You, you won't fail with God. You just keep retaking the test until you pass. <laughs> How many have been around the mountain a time or two and you wonder, what the heck, you know, what's going on? All right, well, see, if you don't get it the first time, you go around again and you retake the test. So, I got to the point where I'm wondering, God, what the heck is going on? If you want to save the world, why don't you just get on with it then? And uh, 
I worked out that if we took just 1% of the Christians that are on the earth and anointed them like Jesus was anointed, where everywhere they went, nothing could stand before them and resist it. So the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. Just 1% of the Christians, which would give us, uh, I don't know, 100 million like Jesus, would that do it? I thought, wow, if you did that in just 1% of us, we could wrap this thing up in about 30 days. <laughs> and so I'm really asking him, what is the problem? And he graciously spoke to me and said, the problem is the human heart. It's... it's that it's such a slow learner. And, and to get my heart and yours conformed to the image of his dear son takes a bit of work and a bit of time. And see, as important as the harvest is, this is more important to him because it's shaping things for eternity. And... Thus, we find ourselves in a very convoluted, random journey of life where you're going up and down and in and out, and you're trying to apply everything you learn, but you still get sick, and you still get tired, and you still get this, and you still get that. And sometimes it's minor, and sometimes it's major. And you're called to be an overcomer. So it took me back to have a look at history, it took me back to have a, a look at the Word of God. And I realized that uh, many of us are unprepared for adversity. They think that adversity um, is because of their own failure or sin or something. And often it is. But see, it's going to come anyway. And let's have a look at John chapter 16, verse 33, in the words of Jesus, he said this, in the world you will have tribulation or trouble, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Now, will you speak that into the ear of somebody near you? You're going to have trouble, but cheer up, he's overcome the world. I mean, that's... <clears throat> that gives us a long-term goal, a long-term perspective. Now, there's a popular theology that says this. Uh, if I pray enough, if I study enough, if I memorize the Word enough, if I give enough, if I share Christ enough, if I attend church enough, and if I'm good enough, and I renew, renew my mind enough, and if I learn to love enough, and if I do this, that, and the other enough, life will be a walk in the park for me. Because the favor of God will surround me, and I'll just go from favor to favor to favor to favor. And, and then when something goes wrong, we're like, what have I done? What has happened? And see... God has other aspects of his plan. Now, some of you here are in a really good place this week. And others are going through it right now. And you're trying to be a good pastor, to quote a dear friend. But you're struggling with making sense of the whole thing. Am I talking to anybody here? <clears throat> I want to help us get rid of that confusion. Matthew 7, 24, 5, Jesus tells a parable about two guys who build a house. One guy built his house on the rock. The other guy built his house on the sand. What happened? Life happened around them. And I'm sure most of the days were sunny and bright and everything. But then the storm came 
and the rains came and the wind came and everything and the house that was built on the sand washed away and the one that was built on the rock, it stood. So what was the difference? Come on, all you wonderful Bible scholars. and <laughs> See, the foundation is different. And it's, it's, we have to build on trusting the Lord Jesus Christ no matter what happens in life so that your foundation is never going to get washed away. But the point is, the rain and the wind and the storm came upon both of them. So you're not exempt from the storm, but you're, as long as you stay on your foundation, you're almost guaranteed that you're going to ride it out. So that's a good thing, isn't it? Now, don't get quiet on me. <laughs> I'm not prophesying disaster coming your way, but I'd like to meet someone who's never had a turn yet. If you haven't had your turn... Don't feel left out because he'll get around to you. He'll get around to you. Psalm 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Now, what a thing to write in the Bible. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. How many love that verse? We like the second half. The Lord delivers him out of them all. Hebrews 5.8, talking about Jesus, said he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. And you're like, what? Jesus suffered? Yeah. Hebrews 12.2, he endured the cross, despising the shame. So when we take a, a, a historical perspective on life on earth, we see that it's, it's fraught with problems. There's been wars, there's been problems, there's been disasters that, that just keep on happening all the time. And we know that that's because there, there is a battle going on between light and darkness, between good and evil. How many are aware of that? We do not live in a devil-free world uh, yet. And so he... He tries everything he can to discourage you. And sometimes it gets you down. You know, our, our friend Andrew, who we prayed for yesterday, is unjustly in a Turkish jail accused of, of, of espionage. And in his, his 10 or 12 cellmates are all... Um, um, Muslims, but they're charged with similar things, and they're trying to make up for it by converting Andrew to Islam. So that's their, their daily um, pursuit. And we need to pray for him and others like him that he'll keep going back to his foundation and not let that kind of a storm wash him away. That's, that's the kind of thing I mean. Because see, life is not just a, a, a casual test once in a while. Some of these things are absolutely um, earth-shaking to people. I called a guy yesterday uh, who is connected with us in the, in the garden work. He lives in Toronto, but... He's one of the, he's very, very knowledgeable and one of the trainers. And uh, he, he lost his daughter to cancer about a year ago. And it was a horrendous trial and they were full of faith. He brought her here several times. We prayed for her several times. And you know, she would rebound a little bit and uh, you get your hopes up and everything. But she died about a year ago. And so I, I called him about some other things, but I, I said, uh, first of all, I just want to say how sorry I am to, to hear about the loss of your daughter. And he's telling me, he said, John, it almost caused me to abandon my faith in God. And, but he came through. 
Why? Because the faithful one never really left him. And it's where you put your gaze that makes all the difference. You have to keep your eyes on him. And so I was really glad to hear that. And, you know, my own granddaughter Jackie's going through a similar thing right now because of the loss of her baby at birth uh, six months ago, whatever. And so trials come, don't they, that make absolutely no sense to you. And this is your opportunity of mine to be an overcomer. But that why question keeps popping up. So when we get into the scriptures and want a biblical perspective, we need to look at the characters in the Bible. And I want you to think of your, your favorite character in scripture and then shout it out to me Jesus good Paul David Joseph Isaiah who Daniel okay now I want you to think of one that had absolutely no problems in life Who? Enoch. <laughs> Let's think about that a minute. E Enoch lived in Noah's time when things were so bad that the Lord said, I'm sorry I even made man on the face of the earth. He lived with those people. How many think Enoch had a you know, pretty, pretty easy time in life? Besides Duncan. <laughs> now see, in Enoch's case, it doesn't say. We don't know much about him except he walked with God. And one day, he walked right up that heavenly staircase right into glory. And so that, that was an amazing thing. But see, there's something about problems in life that end up being for us like a refiner's fire where it burns off the impurities and leaves the pure gold. And Hebrews tells us that the trial or testing of your faith is even more precious than gold that perishes. Now we know gold as the imperishable metal, but the Lord says, no, that's going to perish too. The trial of your faith is even more precious to him. So let's look at some of these people. Um, you, you mentioned Joseph. Did Joseph have an easy time? You know, he's his father's favorite son because he's actually a type of Jesus. And uh, how many know Jesus is actually a little more favorite than you? You know, just saying, right? He is. And, and so, you know, he... J Joseph was, was Jacob's favorite son, and he dressed him up, and, and the Lord was on him, and he, he, could, he would receive dreams, and he would interpret dreams, and he managed to make his brothers furious because he's like, hey, I, I had this great dream where we were all cutting grain and binding sheaves, and suddenly all your sheaves bowed down to my sheaf. Isn't that a cool dream, brothers? <laughs> And then he had another one about the sun and the moon and the stars all bowing down to him. And Jacob went, wait a minute here, you know. And uh, they hated him because he was preferred. And they end up, rather than kill him, they settled for selling him. And he sold uh, in a humiliating way as a slave in Egypt. And he, 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 it turned out okay for a while because now he's in a wealthy man's home and eventually given charge of it, but then he's framed by the lady of the house and ends up going to prison for about 13 or 14 years. How many want Joseph's anointing? Because he's mapping out how you get it, see? 
<laughs> you go graciously through adversity and you come out the other end and now you're ready to be prime minister of the land. Pharaoh has this dream, Joseph is called, interprets them, boom, he's prime minister just overnight. And uh, we could talk about King David, yeah? How many want David's anointing? See, no hands are going up now. You're all, you're all like, well, I don't know. What am I signing up for here? It's a bit like, pray for patience, you know. <laughs> well, David, minding his own business, and Samuel called him and anointed him with oil. <clears throat> and uh, the Holy Spirit came mightily upon him. By the way, there were two young men Samuel did that to. One was named Saul, and the other's name was David. Whose anointing would you like? How many say David's? You mean the guy that got another man's wife pregnant and had the guy killed? You want, you want his anointing? See, actually, they're both identical. Same man of God poured the same holy oil on two young men. The Spirit of God came on them both and gave them a new heart. And it was amazing. What's the difference? The difference is what you do with it. The difference is how do you go through adversity? Do you humble yourself and do you run to the Lord? That was David's secret. <clears throat> he would run to the Lord always and, and say, oh, it was my fault and I sinned against you and oh God, help and have mercy. Whereas Saul was blame shifting. It wasn't my fault. You didn't come on time. It wasn't my fault. The people made me do it. You know, he's always deflecting it. You need to own your stuff honestly before the Lord. Amen. What's the word? Unfiltered. No filters. I'm guilty, Lord. No filters. <laughs> and he's like, okay, you're starting to get this, you know. But see, David uh, killed Goliath, great favor, married the king's daughter, promoted in the army, and he's a national hero until Saul starts getting jealous of him. And he realizes that the Lord is planning to lift the kingdom off of him and put it on David. And that was the beginning of a lot of trouble. And so David becomes an outlaw and he's running for his life and eventually goes to the Philistines. And they don't even want him because the day a battle came, they're like, no way, you go home. We don't trust you. And when he went home, what did he find? Ziklag, his city, burned to the ground. The wives are gone, the kids are gone, the stuff is gone, and his own men want to stone him. Have you ever been there, pastor? When your own men were ready to stone you. Look, we followed you everywhere, we left everything, we did this, we did that, we went to war with you, we, et cetera, et cetera. And we now lost everything, you've led us into disaster. What does he do? He strengthens himself in the Lord. Oh God, I don't know what to do. And the Lord speaks and says, go after them and you will recover everything. That's a great word right there. And so David manages to hold the guys off and say, listen, the Lord has spoken and said, we're gonna go after them, we're gonna recover everything. And that's what they did. Meanwhile, Saul is killed and David is king over Judah, just like that. It's amazing how fast things can turn around when you hold on and hold on and hold on. See, all these people in Scripture uh, went through this kind of a testing. 1 Peter 1, 7 is a good verse to write down. The trial or the testing of your faith is more precious than gold. Now why does God want us tested? Why does he allow it? Why was Jesus tested? 
I said one time, who can think of someone who, who just went through life no problem? Somebody said, Jesus. I said, are you kidding me? <clears throat> he went to his own hometown. They tried to kill him. There's a popular theology going th through the body of Christ which says, if you do it all right, have enough faith, really know the word, full of prayer, full of worship, full of the spirit, you'll put it all together just right and you'll go through life with no problems. Now see, you can minimize problems because some of them come because of your own wrong choices, because of your own stupidity, because of your own lack of knowledge or for a number of reasons. But I'm talking about people that are sincere and they're trying to really do this right, and yet problems happen. Now you can minimize those problems. Like I said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And you know, those of you that have heard me from time to time, you know that I'm big on don't have faith for the counterattack. And it, just while I'm on that, I'm, I might as well mention, you know, there's a lot of people, a lot of Christian people, who think that if you set out to do something wonderful for the Lord in obedience to a word or a leading that you've had, and when there's pushback, uh, that's proof to you that you must really be in the will of God. And so you doggedly pursue it and, and, and see, don't take that as a sign necessarily. I want to preempt it. Now listen, the devil would like to kill you. Do you know that? So how come you're still alive? Why are you still alive then? Because God is watching over you. And uh, I can remember being in a, a circle of leaders one time and they went around the circle talking about how, how are things. And one after another told about the disasters that they were going through. And uh, one guy's church caught on fire, and another guy got struck, church got struck by lightning, and another this, and another that, and they're like, hallelujah, we're really in the will of God because the devil is just fighting us with all he's got. <laughs> and then it came to my turn, and Carol's sitting beside me, and, and I didn't know what to say because, <laughs> so, I, so I said, well, well I, I don't know, guys, but actually, we're enjoying more favor than we've ever had in all of our lives. So I'm trying to think of something. I said, but we did lose our luggage on the flight, you know, one time. <laughs> well, you know, no sooner did I say that than we lost our luggage again. And I'm like, you know, if you have faith for the counterattack, guess what? According to your faith, be it unto you. So I'm like, nope, I'm not having faith for that. Favor, favor. Thank you, Lord, for our luggage coming faithfully through every time. Thank you, Lord, for this or that. So we do our best with it, don't we? But still, things go wrong sometimes. And I know what it is to battle uh, bad knees and uh, sickness. I mean, I got sick, diarrhea over in Kenya for a couple of days, and and you know, if you're ever caught out in the country in Kenya, you're hard pressed to find a nice flush toilet somewhere. <laughs> and well, I mean, I don't want to get too graphic, but they, they have these little keyholes in the ground that you, you gotta try to hit that, you know. But we just learned to praise the Lord anyhow. <laughs> and then some one lady over there in her, her little garden farm made me a cup of this medicinal tea. And I drank it. And I tell you what, that sorted me right out. I want to I wanna know what that was, you know. <laughs> 
But I, I know what it's like to have my, my left knee here really, really bad through a torn meniscus cartilage. I remember over with Duncan at his family farm, and he's so proud to be showing me the family farm, and look at all that, my grandfather put this together, and da-da-da, and we're walking over these fields, and meanwhile, I'm like, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> and, and so it, it's, it's really hard. And I went to the surgeon, he's like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll just go in there, and we'll give it a shave and a haircut, he says. <laughs> and, I'm like, oh, so no big deal, good as new? Oh, I didn't say that. He said, there's no guarantee. So Carol's like, don't do it. You know? <laughs> so anyway, we fiddled around up and down with it and everything else. But I had a prophetic word one day and went to Australia. Friends prayed for me there. And you know what? I was expecting it was going to just burn up with fire and electricity and be instantly healed, but I didn't feel anything, nothing. I said, pray again, guys, pray again, because it still hurts. I can't feel any change. And they prayed again, and I'm like, well, you know, you, you just carry on, don't you? When it seems like he's not answering your prayer, that's not an occasion to punish God by backsliding. That's an occasion to just... Stand on the rock and let the storm carry on until it's done. But I woke up that next morning and it was totally fine. Totally fine. And then a year or so later, the right one went and it wasn't ever as bad, but it was a battle as well. And, you know, this and that along the way. And Carol's had her issues. She's, she's over two of them pretty much. We, we're getting there, aren't we, baby? But she's on the rock, see? And what I find is if, if she's a little discouraged, I can lift her up. I can encourage her. And similarly, when it's me that's down a bit, she encourages me. And that's what the body of Christ is meant to do. You know, we don't go wrong, ha, ha, that hot shot there. I knew they'd get their turn. Good on you. You know, that's, that's not what we do. We lift one another up and encourage one another because we want to pass the test. <sighs> what else do I want to say about that? Let's talk about the New Testament. Who in the New Testament is your hero? Apostle Paul? Pick any of the apostles. Uh, Peter, how many want his anointing? <laughs> Peter, they say, was crucified upside down because he told them he wasn't worthy to be crucified like his, his master. And so they said, oh, okay, we can, we'll, we'll put you upside down then. And uh, that's how he died. What's on the other side of that, though? What's he doing now? It's glory, see. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 11, gives us a list of all the things he went through. Verse 22 are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? Yeah, so am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I'm speaking like a fool, he said, but so am I. I am even more. In labors more abundant, in stripes or whippings above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often, from the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils of the wilderness, perils in the sea, in perils of false brethren. That's a tough one right there. 
in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting and cold and nakedness, and besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. How many want Paul's anointing? See, I like to come back for a trip and give the report and say, hallelujah, I got upgraded on the flight home. <laughs> I don't come home and boast about all that. <sighs> What's going on? You know, I've heard people say, Paul didn't really have a revelation on faith. <laughs> yeah. I haven't heard it in a while, but you used to hear it. Because if he had had faith, he would, have, he would have surmounted those things and put them under his feet. See, that's what I love about the Lord. He, he rounds out your theology over time. <laughs> and he's getting us to where all of our, you know, youthful, radical edges have been, you know, sort of worn down a bit. It's not quite as sharp an edge as it used to be. How many find that, by the way? Your, your theology has got a little more well-rounded over the years. You know, the good thing for Paul is the Lord told him on the front end, I'll show you what great things you will suffer for my name's sake. How many want a prophetic word like that? From Jesus. So, so we got to put this together with life. See, life is not, the Christian life is not necessarily a North American or Western paradigm. And uh, part of the reason I was in Africa and, and Mexico and Ecuador was because the Lord spoke to me about what about the poor? Take the treasures that are in your heart and carry it to the poor. You know, my highlight from last week was visiting a little farm, and uh, I just said to them, so is everybody okay? Are they healthy? Is there anybody in pain? And, and they thought, yes, our, our, our grandmother, she, she's in pain. And I said, well, can we go and pray for her? Where is she? She's just in the next room. And the next thing I know, they went and brought her out. And so this frail old lady comes out, and she's in tremendous pain. And her, she'd fallen a couple of times in her spine and her back and all this kind of stuff. And, and so I'm saying to them, listen, let's just pray for her. And so we prayed for her and said, Holy Spirit, will you bring your wonderful anointing and touch this dear grandma and set her free told that pain to go and then as we do we say how how are we doing are we getting anywhere with this do you know what she said my left side is completely pain free but my right side has no change i said okay well let's play and let's pray again so we prayed again for the right side and i could just tell without asking her that that had gone too with big big smile on her face and everybody's happy because they really love their grandmothers over there. It's amazing. And uh, that lady was pain-free who had no other options. There's no doctors. There's no money for that. She's just poor. And see, we, we got to take the kingdom to her. Isn't that amazing? And so... That was my highlight, really. I just loved that story. No big deal. We see things like that all over the place, hundreds of them, really. But that one was special. I just felt the pleasure of the Lord in that one. But see, you go through trials in life sometimes. Now, how many of you are going through something honestly, Unfiltered, you're going through something right at the moment. Unashamed to put your hand up high. Wave at him. I'm here I am, Lord. In case you didn't see me, here I am. 
All right, what are you going to do? Are you going to cave in? Are you going to hold on? How many want to hold on? See, Paul and Silas were trying to work out where they should go next on a mission. So they tried to go to Asia, and the Lord said no. And they tried to go here, and the Lord said no. They tried to go to Bithynia, and the Lord said, no, I don't want you to go there. Well, he went to sleep, and he had a dream about a man from Macedonia, remember? And he's like, that's it, Macedonia, come on. Come on, Silas, we got the word. They got on a boat the next morning, and off they go. They sailed to Philippi, the Roman capital of Macedonia, and they got there. And uh, now what? We don't know anybody. And they, they said, well, let's go down by the river and see if anybody's gathered for prayer. And sure enough, Lydia's there. And she welcomed them into her house. And she's a wealthy lady. So they're like, come on. We're in a really nice hotel. We're in a really nice place. There's food. There's this. There's that. And praise God. But then this annoying slave girl who is a fortune teller kept going on and on about these men are the servants of the most high God and you need to listen to them and, and Paul got grieved over it because I mean demons will say the truth sometimes but, but it's wrong spirit and so he got trouble enough and he turned to her and said come out of her you devil you unclean fortune telling spirit and the Lord set her free but now the owners of that girl who made a bit of wonga on her gifting, <laughs> they're upset and they press charges and Paul and Silas are ushered into this kind of a kangaroo court and they're beaten with, with, with rods. You imagine being beaten with a stick. I never thought of it before, but the guys that got beaten with rods over in Malaysia or wherever it was, they get their back is all full of slivers and all kinds of things. So there they are in the inner prison with their feet in the stocks. That means they're locked down, their feet and maybe their hands too. They're locked down and they can't go anywhere. So what are they, what are they saying, do you think, to each other? <laughs> Silas looks over and you and your stupid dreams. <laughs> Look at this now. <laughs> don't tell me that this could be God. Don't, I don't even want to hear that. No, that's not, what he's, that's not what he says. See, they know how this works. He's with us through the good times and the hard times. And he says, you know what, Paul, I think we should sing. Well, what, what do you want to sing? I don't know. Uh, how about our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. And so at midnight, they start singing. And the other prisoners are listening, which means they were trying to sleep. And these guys are singing so loud that they're, they can't sleep. They're probably saying, shut up out there. You know, we're trying to sleep. They kept singing in spite of everything. And all of a sudden, an earthquake rocked that jail, a supernatural earthquake that released chains on everybody. The chains fell off, the stocks broke apart, and everybody's set free, and the jailer freaks out. He wants to kill himself. And Paul must have heard him. He said, don't harm yourself. We're all here. And the guy came in, trembling, fell at his feet, because he'd been hearing him also. What must I do to be saved? See, that is a turnaround, everybody. But you see, you don't, you, don't, you don't have the victory until you've had a battle that you've won. So if we try to go through life without any battles, you never have any wins. Where's all the competitive people here? Like Steve and Duncan and Eric, we hear, and you know, they just love to get out there and give that sport a go and win, right? And uh, so th this, is, this, is, this is the real game here now. We want you to win as a Christian. Again and again and again. So well, that's such a fascinating story. I've just been amazed at that story for years because uh, 
in the morning, you know, they washed their wounds, they took them home, they, you know, fed them and everything, put oil and everything, dressed their wounds. And in the morning, the, the authorities send word. Tell those men they can go. And Paul's like, what? Oh, they think we're just going to vanish into the next day and that's the end of it? No way. They beat us as Roman citizens uncondemned. Let them come themselves and ask me nicely to leave. <laughs> he had a little bit of revenge there, you know. And there, when they heard that, that they had, they had done that to Roman citizens without a proper trial, now they're scared. And, uh, and see, God knows how to turn everything around for good. Doesn't it say that? Romans 8, 28. He causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And we might add, to those who hang in there and get up just one more time. Turn to somebody and say, whatever you do, don't quit. Why? Because he is preparing a destiny for you. Uh, you know, uh, a few years ago, it's four or five years now that we first ministered to the persecuted church. And uh, who all was with me? Dunk, you were with me. Patricia was with me. Stu and Chloe were with me. And a bunch of us. But we went to Turkey and, and we did one of our leader schools there for a group of Iranians. And two-thirds of them came from various parts of Europe. And one-third of them we raised a lot of money, something like 30 grand, to fly them out of Iran. And they all rendezvoused and met, met up at this place in Turkey. And, and we had a leader school. And we met people that have been tortured and suffered uh, horribly because they believed in Jesus. That's the only reason. And here I am up there telling them about the importance of forgiveness and grace and forgiveness. And, and you know, you want to be, you want to give those people a gift that they don't deserve so that you can be unhooked from that and set free. And by the way, if you have not read our book on grace and forgiveness, you owe it to yourself to take that book home with you. It's not a very thick book. Purposely, it's very thin. And what did you say, John? We've sold half, half a million of them or something? Or? Yeah. A lot. It's a must read, okay? Not because I read it, but just the message is so vitally important. But anyway, it seemed that they took it to a whole other level because there was one young couple in there who had been in the same Ivan prison, her in the women's section, him in the men's section. They didn't know... If, each other was dead or alive, but each day they told the both of them, we're going to rape you or your wife to death until you give up on this Jesus and return to his love. Now that's, I can't imagine anything that would get to me any more than that one. And they both said, I guess you're going to have to do what you have to do, but one thing, we will never give up on Jesus because he's done so much for, for, for me. Well, miraculously, they got out, and there they are in our school. And there's another one there, a young woman, a beautiful young woman, about 27 or so, I would guess. And she told how they tortured her to give up her faith. And, and so every day they would cut her, her arm, her back, her legs, and a big scar on her face. And they would squeeze lemon juice into that cut. And they'd say, hey, just give up on Jesus and all this will stop and you can go home tomorrow. Just return to Islam and carry on. And she would say, I could never do that. Islam gave me no hope. Jesus has given me life and life more abundant. And, and so you just have to do what you have to do, but I can never give up on him. 
And miraculously, she got out, and there she is in our school. And I'm thinking, God, am I even saved? <laughs> I was, honestly. Then we went to India among Hindus who were tortured and everything, uh, just right after that, a couple of months later, and it was the same thing. People who were willing to, not just to go through stuff, but willing to die for him if need be, because they so appreciated the gift of eternal life. Friends, we, we need to come to grips with a reality here that God has, has never promised us a walk in the park. He's promised us this. In the world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And so the, the whole thing is, don't give in. Well, why does he allow it? Because he wants to make a champion out of you. See, life doesn't end when you die. That's merely a, a new beginning. It's kind of like the birth of a baby. Okay, you die, you're born now into a whole new dimension of eternity. And you're being prepared to rule over cities. You're bring, being prepared to be a leader like Joseph. I remember years ago, Randy was here, and, and, uh, and Carol was over there just getting, you know, worshiping and really entering in. And Randy said, he announced his title. He says, I want to speak to you tonight about the making of a warrior. And that just dropped down on Carol, and boom, she's on the ground. And the Lord made a warrior out of her. And so for 40 minutes, she's slashing and stomping and fighting and breaking chains and driving out demons. And I mean, it was, she was just going for it. And uh, then after, got up and gave this incredible prophetic word. But see, he wants to make a warrior out of you. Now, warriors are tough. They go through things. They don't just, oh, it's, this is getting too hard. I'm, I'm going to take a pass. Forget this. No, they, when, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Why? Because they have a destiny that's ahead of them. And so all the bub biblical characters, without exception, all went through adversity. Will you let that sink in, first of all? You haven't sinned necessarily. You haven't missed God necessarily. It's just... God wanting to bless you even more in that which is coming. So, let's look at Luke 19, 17. Verse 16 says, the first came. See, these guys have been given uh, amounts of silver, a mina of silver. The first came, say, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. The second one came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, uh, you also be over five cities. And then there's another guy who came and said, your mina, I, I hid it away because I feared you. You're an austere man. You collect where you didn't deposit and you reap what you didn't sow. Imagine saying that to Jesus. That's not the Jesus I know, by the way. He's so good. He's so generous. He's so fantastic. But he says, okay. I'll give you that. If you knew that I was like that, why didn't you take my money and put it on deposit? Then I might have had some interest. Take the mina from him and give it to the guy who has 10. And they're like, what? He's already got 10. Yeah, to everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. So, friends, there's rewards in heaven. Now, I don't find rewards in heaven extremely motivating. Partly, I'm just happy to get there. 
You know, I just want to get there, don't you? But there's rewards. There really is. And he's saying, you were faithful with what I gave you. You overcame the difficulties. You pressed in. I want you to rule over 10 cities. I want you to rule over five cities. And I began to think about that, and I thought, you know what, Lord? In the millennial kingdom, I would really like to sort out the city of Toronto for you. <laughs> that would just be my honor. So I've asked him for that. I don't know if that's one of my five, but anyway, I, I really, really, really would like to do that. What city would you like? Huh? Call it out. You know, we have a, we have a friend named Terry A. Livrod. He was in a meeting where I asked that same question. And this guy, honestly, he's like the Indiana Jones of the mission field. And he yelled out, I want Mecca. And we all felt like we were outdone by him, you know. Was just like, this guy wants a challenge. Okay, give him Mecca. Sort it out for the kingdom of God. But see, this is where it's going, friends. Life does not end when you die. Life just gets better and better. And so when you die, you go be with Jesus. But that's not the end. He is returning to set up his kingdom on this earth. And he's looking for some people like Joseph and like David who have been victorious in overcoming the opposition in life so that he can promote them in leadership. Does that make sense? He, he, you go through the testing of life and it only makes you stronger and stronger so that you will be qualified to lead on a whole different level in the millennial kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, and you know what? The way the world's looking, uh, with the light getting lighter, but the dark getting darker, I don't think his kingdom is very far away. And I would encourage all of you as pastors to begin looking at and preaching about the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ because it is more certain than tomorrow's sunrise. There's a good chance to shout hallelujah or something like that. See, because that's the big deal, by the way. The big deal is not that we won the world for Jesus, necessarily. The big deal is that he's coming back to be king and rule over it all. He really, really is. So, what are you, what are you facing? What are you contending with? Rule over five cities. <sighs> 1 Peter 4, 12 says, you know, don't think it's strange when this fiery trial comes upon you. It's really just preparing you. How do I prepare then? How do I anchor my soul? Anchor your soul in the irrefutable word of God. Um, a couple of years ago, the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to strengthen your faith in the word of God. And it puzzled me at first, you know, I'm like, what? I totally believe the word of God. And what do you mean, Lord? You just said it again. I want you to strengthen your faith in the word of God. So I began listening to Bible teachers, Ravi Zachariah, Chuck Missler, and some others, and just really spending time in it, going deeper. And, and, and it was an astounding revelation to me, some of the things we found. But let me give you some homework. Go to YouTube and look up on, on there uh, one that's called The Most Amazing Verse in the Bible, Genesis 1.1. Oh, my goodness, it's just awesome. In the work of Ivan Painin, you can, you can look that one up, too. It's Chuck Missler, Matthew series, session one, where he unpacks uh, the work of this Russian mathematician who got saved at Harvard and then spent 
50 years of his life studying the mathematics of the New Testament. And you're like, what? Yeah, it, it'll absolutely blow your mind. I've watched it three or four times, and the first time I was just there with my mouth hanging open. And it strengthened my faith in the Word of God. I really, really want that, don't you? Amen? Amen. And so, how many want to be an overcomer? Just for fun, just put the word overcomer in your computer Bible search and read all those verses about being an overcomer. There's a lot of them, but, it, but the one we often quote, they overcame the enemy by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their own lives even unto death. Now that's an overcomer, isn't it? And if you read Hebrews 11, you see that, hey, they, they stopped the mouth of lions, they quenched the violence of fire, they did this, they did that, they did that other. And then it says, and others. How would you like to be one of the others who were sawn in half or who were tortured or who had this or that or the other? But in every case, they passed the test because they would not yield. Some were delivered supernaturally, others died in the process, but in both cases, they didn't yield. Friends, we are heading rapidly into the time of the greatest harvest the world has ever seen. So if you've been whinging about not enough people in your church and not enough souls being saved and everything, that is about to change very radically. So here's my question for you. What are you going to do when you wake up in the morning and there's a thousand people outside the, the, your, your house and they want you to pray for them because they've heard miracles happen when you pray? How are you going to handle that? It's actually fun being overwhelmed by blessing for a change. Uh, it's been a long time that we were totally overwhelmed. You know, we've, we've got pictures of people lining all the way down the street um, trying to get in. Why? It wasn't because some famous speaker was here. It was they heard that God was here. The very thing that's touched a number of these people here this morning, that touch of the Holy Spirit brought millions of people to this place. They want God. People are hungry for God. We owe it to them to get absolutely filled up with the Holy Spirit, get off that pity party that we've been on, give yourself a slap, and straighten up and say, I'm going to finish well. Come on. Come on. Boom. Yeah? But in the meantime, when you're going through stuff, you don't have to pretend that you're not. In other words, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. That's... That's, that's not what, what we're going to do. We're going to get honest about it and say, well, if, if that's a, a sincere question, then it deserves a sincere answer. The, the truth is, I'm not doing really well at the moment. I want to be, but I need you to pray for me or encourage me or whatever because this, that, or the other is going on. See, it never helps by lying about it and saying I'm fine when you're not fine. Does it? I mean, how would that impress the God of truth, for example? <laughs> if you are going through it at the moment, maybe a whole lot, maybe a little bit or whatever, but it's the enemy's whispering to you that, you know what, you can't make this Christian faith thing work. Why don't you just pack it in because it works for him and it works for her but it doesn't work for you right we both know that why don't you just give up on this deal and people are bombarded with that voice but it's not the voice of the Holy Spirit if you're going through stuff right now and you need to be encouraged unashamedly stand to your feet
you're confused. You're like, Lord, I don't know. I, I did this. I did that. I tried the other. We prayed. We believed. We had the elders come and lay hands, and they still weren't healed. This, that, and the other happened. <sighs> you know, the Bible says, having done all, we stand. So I want you to just move to where your life, your house, is being built upon the rock. Make sure you're on the rock. Now, I feel like it would be good if, can we just clear the front, Dunk, and uh, just ha have these folks. I want to invite those of you who had the courage to stand up just to come on down and gather around the front right here. Just come on. And I'm going to ask you to get a bigger vision, like a, a further horizon, all right? You are a part of the greatest thing in the history of the human race. Jesus has found you and saved you and brought you in and, and taught you a bit about his love and his care. You're just going through a test right now, that's all. Just, just come in a little tighter because we got some that are still in the aisle. So, first of all, I want to lift all shame off of you. And just say, look, it's just your turn, that's all. Well, why is he allowing it? I don't know, but it'll make you a better person once you're looking back on it. Have you ever gone through a tragedy and later on it becomes a funny story? That you laugh about, but it wasn't funny two or three years ago. Have you got any of those? No? Lord, I lift all these friends right now before you. Ministry team, if you want to just feel free. Some of you ministry team may be up here. But just feel free to circulate among them and encourage people. But listen, there was an old song that one of the quartets used to sing that went like this. My trials only help to make me strong. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Now, you know how you pass a test with God? You just make up your mind. You're going to pass. You know, you know what? I'm going to pass this test. That's it. You just make a right choice, and you do it. So I want you to say this with me. Lord, I'm going to pass this test. Because your grace is absolutely reliable and dependable. So I want you to pick up your feet and move over and stand on the rock, Christ Jesus. I'm standing on the rock, Christ Jesus, and therefore no storm can blow my life away. I'm going to go through this in his name. Now see, sometimes, friends, it's horrendous. The hardest thing that I ever went through was the breakup of my first marriage. And I begged God to fix it. And again and again. And it didn't happen. You know why? Because it takes two. Like one person deciding is not enough. You have to have two to agree on that. And I, I thought I would be disqualified for everything. But there were some hard years. I was Mr. Mom, two girls. And, uh, you know, I got really hurt. And I vowed in my heart that no woman will ever hurt me like that again. 
and so you keep them away. But somehow Carol got through my defenses. And, uh, you know, we're coming up on 37 years together now. It's awesome. But see, if that hadn't happened, I don't think I would have been in a revival leader, you know, because it just, it just, looking back on it, it was impossible under the former circumstances. So sometimes God's plan B is a whole lot better than plan A ever was. They say, but it seems so wrong. I know, I know. All I know is when Carol and I got together, favor came on us. And, and we settled into a groove of the blessing of the Lord. There's, there's a rainbow on the other side of your storm, my friend. It could be a minor thing, it could be a major thing, I don't know. But I tell you what, a theology that says life will always go well with you is not a biblical theology. Just based on all the Bible characters alone, Jesus included. But what is biblical is you and I, along with them, being overcomers. Now, how many want to be an overcomer? Not every hand is up. Heaven's watching and counting right now. You want to be an overcomer? Okay, listen carefully. Overcomers need a few things to overcome. Winners need a few battles to win. Okay, that's all. And then pretty soon, you're going to find yourself in glory. I love what Heidi said one time, is that if you, if you, if you ever want to raise the dead one day, you know, get busy because in heaven, you won't be able to do that. You got to do that here. So there's contending for answered prayer. Father, I thank you for all these who have gathered. And I lift the shame, I lift the fear, I lift the sense of failure, and I ask you, Lord, to turn it all around. And I bless them for having a go at life. I bless them for pressing in and saying, God, we're going to trust you no matter what. We are moving our our house, our life over to a firm foundation and we're standing on the rock. And let the rain fall, let the wind blow, let the storm come, but we're on the rock and we will not be moved in the mighty name of Jesus. So, Holy Spirit, we can't do it in our own strength, but we can partner with you in our, in our resolution to go through life and finish well and finish strong in the name of Jesus. Now listen, some of you need to repent for embracing discouragement and embracing uh, I can't do this kind of mentality. How many need to do that? You just feel like you need to do it. Say it out loud. Lord, I'm sorry that I... I was giving up way too soon. I was hanging on by, the, by, the, by my fingernails or whatever. But I shake that off in Jesus' name. And we're embracing the King of kings and Lord of lords. Holy Spirit, will you come and put your fiery presence into their backbone? And will you strengthen us? And Lord, I, I pray that you will take every seeming failure and turn it into a strength, as only you can do. Because all the trials Paul went through, they only served to help to make him strong. He boasted about them after a while. And you will too.
Now listen, I want you to get with one other person, at least one, and say, hey, I want you to come into agreement with me that I will be more than a conqueror through him who loved me. All of you in your seats, just stand up to get with one other person. Let's agree. We're victorious. We're more than conquerors. We're the victors. We're the dread champions of the earth. We're the ones that he purchased with his blood because he thought you were absolutely worth it. Get in a group of two or three and come into agreement for you to be an overcomer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hold on, Joe.